Hi, this is Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and it's always an honor to have you back with us here on EWTN for Living Divine Mercy. We all know that the Trinity is a mystery. God the Father is called the first person of the Trinity, not because he is greater or older than the other two, but because he is unbegotten, meaning he proceeds or comes from no one. The second person of the Trinity is called the Son because he is the only begotten of the Father, meaning he proceeds or comes from the Father, being called the wisdom of the Father or the eternal word, hence EWTN, the Eternal Word Television Network. The third person of the Trinity is called the Holy Spirit, because from all eternity he is breathed forth by the Father and the Son. The Father speaks, and when he speaks comes the Word, but that Word is powered by a breath, and that's the Holy Spirit. Now, we also say that the Holy Spirit is simply the love between the Father and the Son. Yes, the love between the Father and the Son is so great that from it comes a third person or precedes a third person, the Holy Spirit. Our faith teaches that all three are uncreated and eternal. So what does all of this mean? Well, let's go through the Nicene Creed or the profession of faith that we make at every Sunday Mass. We are so let's begin a detailed look at the Creed starting from the very beginning. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Okay, we believe in one God in three persons, not three gods. And our one God is not only our King and Lord, he is our Heavenly Father, or Abba. We are his adopted children. God is Lord over all and thus has all might, so he is almighty. Next we pray, maker of heaven and earth. We pray this because we attribute to the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, the first act of mercy, which is creation. Then we say, of all things visible and invisible. The Father created everything that we can see, like the earth around us, but he also created all the things that we cannot see, like the angels and even our own souls. All are invisible. Okay, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. The Trinity is one God. The second person of the Trinity is the Word of God, the Son. As we said, the Father speaks that Word. And Jesus is this second person made incarnate in humanity. The others are not. Okay, we pray now. The only begotten Son of God born of the Father before all ages. Okay, Jesus, he was born and begotten, which means he comes from or proceeds from the Father, as we said, but he is not created. He has always existed. Jesus is fully God and he is eternal, just as the Father is eternal. He existed before all ages. Now, God from God. We said the Word of God, Jesus Christ, proceeds from the Father. God, the Son, came from God, the Father. So it is God from God. Next we pray, light from light. God reveals to us in Genesis that God speaks in order to create. And what did he say? Let there be light. So the light of the world came from God's word, light. Then we pray, true God from true God. The truth of God, the Son, came from the truth of God, the Father, when he spoke the truth. True God from true God. Next we pray, begotten, not made. Again, 
No person of the Trinity is created, so they are not made. But the Son is begotten of the Father. As we said, he came from the Father. And the council fathers refuted the Arian heresy, which claimed that Jesus was created and was not truly God, which we know he is. Okay, then we say consubstantial with the Father. Consubstantial means one and the same substance, essence, or nature. This emphasizes that there is one God of one substance, sharing one divine nature. But each person is distinct from the other. They live in relation to each other. But only Jesus is fully God and fully man in his nature. Okay? Through him... All things were made. There is also the realization that it is through the word of God that all things were created. John chapter 1 verse 3 says, all things were made through him. Okay, now we pray for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. Well, Jesus Christ, the word of God, was sent on a mission by the Father to come down from heaven in order to redeem humanity and offer us salvation. Okay, and then we pray, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. In the Latin rite, we bow during this paragraph in honor of the incarnation. By the free choice of Mary, our mother, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the word of God took on flesh. The second person of the Trinity condescended to share in our humanity and became a man named Jesus Christ. Our God became one of us, which makes us different than any other religion in the world. Okay, then we pray for our sake. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the Roman prefect, or basically the governor of the Roman province of Judea. And the council fathers include this, quote, under Pontius Pilate to show that this was a real historical reality. Okay, next, he suffered death and was buried. Jesus became man in order to accomplish the work of our salvation. And it was for us that Jesus was crucified because the penalty for sin is death. Then we pray, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus truly rose from the dead on the third day after being buried, as Christ himself predicted in the scriptures. The three days were the partial days of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Next, we say he ascended into heaven. Now, this was 40 days after the resurrection and then allowed the Holy Spirit to descend down upon mankind. Okay? And is seated at the right hand of the Father. Christ now reigns in heaven as king at the right hand of God the Father, a place of honor, but there is nobody on God's left. Okay, now we pray he will come again in glory. Jesus has now his perfected or glorified body, and we believe that he will come again in this glorified body. This isn't the rapture. This is what we call the second coming of Christ. Okay, let's keep going to judge the living and the dead. At the second coming of Christ will be the general judgment. Remember, our particular judgment was at our own death. But now we have the general judgment where he will judge the living and the dead. And everything we have not confessed will be laid bare and true justice will be accomplished so that we won't be upset by who is not in heaven or who is in heaven. And his kingdom will have no end. This second coming will result in the passing away of the old heaven and the old earth, and then the establishing of Jesus' everlasting kingdom. Then we pray, I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
Again, this is the third person of the Trinity, who, as we said, is the love between the Father and the Son, a love so great that it became a person, like a child is a person who comes from the love between the husband and the wife, between two human parents, okay? The Lord, the giver of life. We rightly call the Holy Spirit the Lord and the giver of life because God breathed life into the first man. And this holy breath of God is the Holy Spirit, which gives life and sustains life. Next, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, unlike the Son who comes from the Father alone, the Holy Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son. In the East, they believe he comes only from the Father, but not us in the West. We believe he comes from the Father and the Son. Next, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. Yes, the Holy Spirit is God as well, so he is glorified and loved as God, along with the Father and the Son. They are all equal. Next, who has spoken through the prophets? We believe the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets. He never speaks on his own, but rather communicates what comes from the Son, as the Son only communicates what comes from the Father. So, we know the Father through the Son, and we know the Son through the Holy Spirit. Okay, getting wrapped up here, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The church of Jesus Christ is his mystical body. Uh, the church is one because Christ's body is one. Therefore, the church is also holy because it's the body of Christ, even if the human beings who comprise it are not always holy. Okay, now, like Jesus, the church is human and divine. In her human nature, she can fail, but in her divine nature, she is perfect and holy. Next, we also say the church is Catholic, but with a small c, which simply means universal. And then we said the church is apostolic because Christ founded it upon the apostles. Next, we pray, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We enter into the body of Christ, the church, through baptism, by which we are forgiven of original sin, thus becoming adopted sons and daughters of God our Father. The Bible says we need baptism by water and spirit for salvation. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. We believe that when Christ comes again, we will be reunited with our bodies in a glorified way like him, similar to Christ's resurrected body. Then we pray, and the life of the world to come. The world to come is simply heaven. This is eternal blessedness in the company of all the angels and the saints in constant praise and love of God forever. How amazing. This is called the beatific vision. And finally, we pray, amen. This means yes, or I believe. It is the only ending to the creed that we could say because we can't know any of this on our own. God had to reveal it to us, which he did through his church. Our amen is the response from our heart of saying, I believe this. What an incredible prayer that summarizes our whole faith, and thus we call it the profession of faith. Now let's hear the story of Father James Bores. This is a priest who went through some incredible tragedy in his life, but also is a way to learn by example that God is always with us. God's creation is beautiful, and when I go down to that beach and the pier, I just feel very close to God. I thank God every day that I wake up. What gift am I going to receive today? God will always bring good from every evil. He'll bring good from everything bad that happens. 
It is one of the most poured over verses of the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The concept that God will always bring good, even from heartbreak. Perhaps it's because, to mortal eyes, sometimes that good is, at first, not easy to see. No one has come to a better understanding of this than the Boers family, sons Michael and Jeff, and their dad Jim. To begin with, if you were to ask Michael and Jeff what their dad does for a living, they would tell you, And our people, secure, free, and happy. Amen. He's a priest. That's Father Jim, offering a memorial service for the class of 1983 at the Naval Academy Chapel in Annapolis. Kim, can you believe it's been 40 years? His presence here is more fitting than you know, for Jim Boers is a graduate of that class. He had chosen a career in the Navy. God apparently said, that's okay for now, but it was actually at the academy that God began nudging him toward the priesthood. For although he was born into a very active Catholic family, Jim Boers had left the church, saying he wasn't getting a thing out of attending mass. I was down in the weight room working out, and an upper-class midshipman in the company came up to me and shared the gospel with me. I'd never heard that. And then he invited me to um, Bible study and a rally. Midshipman Jim admired the zeal with which his newfound Protestant friends approached their evangelism. But something very Catholic reaffirmed his faith in the church. What about the poor? Like, we need to help the poor as well. And so I kind of missed that very humble dimension of what the Catholic Church has been for 2,000 years. So spiritual renewal and naval education complete, life indulged Jim's latter passion with a new adventure, serving on board a fast attack submarine whose mission remains top secret even to this day. And if we had been caught or had, an, had uh, a mistake made, it certainly would have been an international incident or, and or we may not have returned home. Military secrets being what they may, something more purely remarkable was shaping Jim's life at this time. A love at first sight. I met Shirley, who later became my wife, at a parish picnic. I'm like, how come I didn't get her number? And all I knew was it looked like they were heading on the, a white station wagon, and I knew they lived on the east side of town. So next Saturday, I go to the only elementary school on that side of the river and I knock on all the doors that had white station wagons. And of course, if you were to do that today, you're, 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 the door would be slammed in your face. Jim spent the next two decades plus at various jobs in the private sector. All the while, Jim's participation in the church grew. His grateful heart did as well. He blessed me with a wonderful, beautiful wife on the inside and outside, two children, two sons, Michael and Jeff, that she poured her life into I learned what it was like to be a f husband and a father. And so those things, God was preparing me. He knew what would happen. My wife suffered from mental illness, which ran in her family. Those kind of deep, deep-rooted things stay, stay with you. I had seen her struggle with the new medication and the increased doses of the medication that her psychiatrist was giving her. Most of people, it doesn't happen, but for a small percentage of people, it literally induces suicidal thoughts. And soon after that, she took her life. I didn't see it coming. It was, it was tragic. It was devastating. I can speak to it now somewhat, you know, without um, lots of tears. I don't know what I would have done without my faith and without all the loving people in my home parish. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked. His fellow parishioners not only loved him, they knew him. They started asking him to pray about a calling to the priesthood. Soon, James Boers came to understand what they had already seen. Actually, one of the first things Jeff said was like, oh, like, yeah, this is, this is definitely different, but it's not a surprise, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Do you know what happens when you become baptized? He's got skills from uh, his Navy time with, with leadership and leading people and, and taking initiative to kind of start new programs and Bible studies. He's always been um, active as far as um, taking action. So I think some of those things and is, is what the pe people saw. It is inspiring and motivating to see him care so much and to, you know, truly he's dedicated the, the rest of his life to this. In addition to my dad's 
in integrity and, and he also has a teaching spirit. And ask everybody what their favorite animal is. Going to bed when I was really little, I remember specifically we had a, a, a large picture of a bunch of different jungle animals. He would come in and make up a story about those animals in which there was always a, a moral lesson at the end of the story. So sharks actually use the sense of touch is what you're saying. So that's another, how, how can that be a spiritual analogy? Always evangelizing, Father Bors has embarked on a new crusade. He calls it three in one. Three people in one year. So you're going to invite people to three events, to mass or some kind of pastor event, because if we don't invite them, who is? His special focus is on bringing men to Catholicism, for studies show that if the dad in a family is faithful, the entire family follows. This idea of invitation and, and, and inviting people is what is truly going to change the world because when we read the Gospels, we see that's what Jesus did. He invited people. Here in Jeff's blacksmith workshop in his garage, the family is creating a cross. It is a fitting analogy, for their faith too has been forged in the fire of tragedy only to emerge strong as iron. And even though my sons and I were, our lives were changed and turned upside down, God always turns bad things into good. That's what Jesus' death and his resurrection are all about, that God is with us. Jesus came not to remove our suffering, but to accompany us in our suffering. There are many lessons that I've drawn from him. I got to see how much my dad cares about the faith and about the last things and about the, the ultimate things. My dad tackles those with, with a great deal of energy and that's been a kind of inspiration for how I try to approach life. Like he'll always be dad to me and I recognize that I now have to share him and now he's father to you know a whole congregation and, and a community of people. But um, to me, he'll always be dad. What would Shirley have thought about me now? Well, I think she's saying, I'm not surprised, and God bless you. Love never, ever ends. And so Shirley's love for me and my love for her never ends. And I know she's pouring her love and prayers for Michael and Jeffrey and Julia. Knowing what she knows now, where she is, I imagine she is very happy. Well, in one sense, you could say that the mystery of faith is like a divine egg corn that was planted in human soil and that it grows over time. It's not as though God is revealing more and more. It's that our understanding is growing more and more. And so when you look at the Apostles' Creed, you can trace this back to the first century without any clear certitude as to exactly what, you know, what its origins were. You know, though, in the, uh, the first generation that when people were evangelized and then catechized and then eventually baptized, they had to be able to summarize what it is they're believing, what it is they're confessing. And so in the question and answer form that we find in Ambrose and other sources, you realize they're tracing this all the way back to the first century. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I do. Mm -hmm. And then you go through it. Kind of like the baptismal promise. Exactly. That you talk about is the basis of a lot of this. That's too. right. We see the early version of a creed, let's say. And I think over time, as you begin to realize that what I received when I was first baptized, what I confessed, what we all professed was a whole lot more than we realized or appreciated at the time. For me, the opening line of the creed contains more power, more beauty, more truth than most people ever really articulate in a lifetime, and it's on our lips every week. Oh, how sweet it is to have in the depth of one's soul that which the church tells us we must believe. Oh, Jesus, save me. I believe in you with all my heart. So many times I have seen the radiance of your face, and now where are you, Lord? I believe, I believe, and again, I believe in you, triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in all the truths which your Holy Church gives me to believe. O Christ, a single gaze from you is dearer to me than a thousand worlds, than all heaven itself. Lord, 
you can make my soul capable of understanding completely who you are. I know and I believe that you can do all things. If you have deigned to give yourself to me so generously, then I know that you can be even more generous. Well, thank you, everybody, for being with us for this incredibly important topic of the Nicene Creed. This is what the apostles taught. This is what the apostles believed. And it is our profession of faith. Now, stay with us as next we'll be talking about the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.